And we're live. Mr. David Jennings, welcome. It's good to have you on, my friend. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having us, James. Looking forward to it. My pleasure, man. This is a cracker book. Absolute cracker book. I love what you've done here, and I'm pretty pumped to like to dive into this. Um, you've done some cool shit, man. Like when I was, uh, for mm-hmm. everyone who's listening, like I, I was introduced to Dave by two people, actually, a bloke called Charlie Valor, another guy called Kim Barrett, two guys I hold in, in very high esteem. Uh, and they said, this guy's cool. You've got to talk to him. I was like, all right, well, yeah, I've heard that a million times before. I'll go, go into him. I was like, but David, you sold the MCG. And I was like, I read that. And I was like, that's weird. That's a little bit <laughs> unusual. Can you go into like how you got about to selling the MCG? Yeah, yeah. Well, it started off reading a book. And I was reading a book about a guy called Paul Hartunian who sold the Brooklyn Bridge. And it told this story of how this guy got his hands on a bunch of discarded pieces of wood from the Brooklyn Bridge when they were doing some renovating. So I just read that book and then I was driving past the MCG and they were doing renovations on the MCG. They'd, there's a big gaping hole in one side of it where the Ponsford stand was and I was driving through my little red laser and I remember the moment it was like fireworks went off in my brain and I thought, I could just do exactly what this guy just did and copy his system, his exact approach for the way that he sold the Brooklyn Bridge. And um, basically what he did and and what I did, I got my hands on uh, pieces of the, um, they had green wooden seating, which is really iconic for the MCG. And also they had this MCC crested carpet and it looked pretty awesome with the logo kind of all stenciled in. And I um, ended up kind of, chasing up who the wrecker was and was standing in this big old dusty warehouse and took a big pile of the wood and the carpet. And I said, at the time, it was a bit funny. I said, um, oh, I'm going to come back for that big roll you've got there. And they had this huge roll of carpet and I only took as much that I could fit into my dad's car at the time. And uh, I got home. I started kind of writing out a press release again, just modeling what this guy, Paul Hartunian did. I literally wrote the press release Melbourne man sells the MCG for twenty four ninety five, and I had the the visions of me chopping up the wood into little pieces. And I went down to Office Works and bought the certificate paper, and I'm sticking it onto the certificate paper with the little gold seal. And the plan was to sell that for twenty four ninety five. And the next day, so I kind of started painting this picture in my head of what was going to happen. And uh, the next day, I went back to the wrecker, and I said, "Oh, I'll grab that big roll." And they said, "Oh, someone." came in yesterday actually and bought that last big roll of carpet and I thought oh that's a little bit odd and they said oh the the guy said he was going to use it to line his pool room floor and I didn't give much of a a thought after that to it and um, I started telling a couple of friends what I had planned and I was booked in to go to this conference in Queensland and I thought well before I go before I send this press release out I I want to be in Victoria when it actually happens. So I'll wait until after the conference. And when I get back, then I'll send the press release out. And uh, I, I flew up, started doing the conference. And then I started getting these texts and phone calls from a couple of friends that I told what I was going to do. Um, and they said, did you tell this idea to anybody else? And I was like, no. And they said, there's a guy, he's 21, he's down here, he's on the news and he's doing exactly what you were planning on doing and I remember at the time I felt gutted like I felt like you know this was my one big opportunity of a lifetime and someone had kind of stepped in and and beat me to the punch um and I was just stewing over it up at this conference I'm sitting in the room I can hardly think of anything else and I'm just and they had because the conference that the um the guy who was running it Brad Sugar sent out a book um, beforehand, which is called the One Minute Millionaire, and that was the uh, the book that gave me the idea um, for Paul Hartunian. And then they ran a competition at this at, at this conference, and they said, um, "Has anyone taken what they learned from the book and applied it?" And they got everybody to stand up and tell their story. And I started telling the MCG story, and I said, "I've got my hands on all of this, uh, and, and it's sitting at home, and I'm going to do it when I got back." Uh, And someone in the audience said, I've just heard someone's doing that on the news from someone back home. And it was just like, this was my idea. And uh, that's what it felt like. And I got to the end of the conference, got back home. And then I just thought, look, 
what else am I going to do? I've got this big pile of wooden carpet sitting in mum's garage. Um, I might as well just keep doing it. So I wrote a little uh, news article that I ran in MX Magazine, um, which is like a thing they handed out on the trains. And uh, I, I remember I MX back in the day when I was a poor oh, uni student. Know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the old MX magazine, and, and I just copied the press release, which was Melbourne Man sells um, the MCG for twenty four ninety five, and and paid to run the ad, and then uh, it's like the media confused me or something, or got Pete and I mixed up. Who was the, the other guy who did it? Uh, and they, I had the Herald Sun contact me, and then I got on the Today Show, and then I got on Nova Radio, and then I kind of still managed to kind of get part of this, you know, the snowball that was happening because it was only within a week or two. And I kind of turned that, um, what felt like at the time, those lemons into lemonade and sold a truckload, sold out of the carpet, um, still got a big pile of the wood sitting at mum's. Um, but that was kind I of like... mum's stoked with that. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's how well. <laughs> sitting in the garage, collecting dust. How, um, how much did you make out of that, out of selling all that stuff? Yeah, look, it would have been about a hundred grand. And then I kind of, I sold out of the carpet. The the carpet's where the money was because I was selling these frames for like a grand um, and the little pieces were quite small, thin slivers. So who knows? I probably got another 100 grand sitting at mum's still. If I kept on chopping it up, I need to do like the 20-year the anniversary or something. Um, but Pete, actually, the other guy who sold the MCG, um, actually became my arch nemesis as well at that point in time. I kind of just... Uh, saw him as you know ultimate evil and you know my my arch rival um and then he just started popping up everywhere and i saw him at some conferences and cut a long story short and um, we ended up becoming really good friends and found out we were similar in a lot of different ways not just selling the mcg um and he had me um do like a little reading at his wedding and i did a reading at his uh, wedding and he did a reading That's at my cool. wedding and uh yeah it was kind of Funny how it all kind of played out. Yeah, definitely, man, definitely. And I think like another one of the cool things you told me about, which which I learned about you, was you do jujitsu as well. So yes. not only are you a systems guy, but you're also you also love strangling men, or what we call <laughs> like in, in what, what, I've heard some yeah, good yeah. terms for it. It's like involuntary yoga or the art of folding clothes with people still in them. Uh, yes, you actually did pretty one. well, mate. You did you did well. You went over to AD, ADCC, is that right? Yes, yeah. You did that. Or, or the pan packs in Victoria. That, uh, look, if we're going to make a confession, I kind of feel like uh, this is the podcast to do it. I do have a little confession to make. Um, I fell in love with jiu-jitsu. It must have been the UFC was like USC 5 and 6 and like the Gracies were, you know, in their heyday and I was – watching them crush everybody. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is what I want to do. You're old, like was, man. You are Yeah, old. back in 99. And um, I was just at school and I started doing jiu-jitsu and did it for uh, a, a couple of years in final years of school. And then um, uh, ended up, they had the Pan Pacifics on uh, in Victoria. And I thought, oh, I'll go along to that. And I competed. Um, and when I got there, there were actually only three competitors because it was so early days, jiu-jitsu, and no one else was uh, around. There was just three other people. Uh, and I ended up getting a silver medal for the Pan Packs, but there were only three of us. Like, that's that's the big that. reveal. Um, I, I've not really told anyone that. Usually I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got a silver medal at uh, the Pan Packs. Um, but yeah, uh, there were only three of us. So that's kind of like the, the, the dirty secret of that. But then I took like 10 years off and, um, you know, life got in the way. And last couple of years, I'd just gotten back to it. Um, and I I had just got, when at the end of the pan packs, I got my blue belt. Uh, and then I retired for uh, 10, 15 years. And now that I've come back, I thought, oh yeah, I'll go back as a white belt. So I'm happy to announce on the podcast here, I've just got my blue belt again. So there was a bit of a joke around the gym that I was, uh, even while I was on the white belt, I'm blue belt Dave because I used to be blue belt, but then demoted myself because uh, I felt like I had too long off. Oh, dude, you need it, right? If you if you go back, like the the, the rate at which jujitsu progresses is insane, and the rate at which you regress if you're not doing it is yeah. is crazy. Yeah. But you, so you had you had 10, 15 years off because obviously you were a little bit busy running a business or two. Yes. One thing I noticed is you've also done a TED talk, right? How yes. was that? 
Because that's pretty. That's pretty fucking cool, wild. man. Yeah. Look, I, I had, I had this thing, and it happens all the time where some little crazy opportunity falls in my lap, and then I just follow it, and I just go, "Oh, this is odd." So I had an email from a guy in, from Amsterdam, or just side outside of Amsterdam. And it was into my Hotmail address. This was, you know, obviously my Hotmail. email had been scraped from LinkedIn uh, and it was my Hotmail address. And this random person contacted me and said, oh, look, um, I am on this student council for this uh, TEDx thing. And I was asking my dad who I should get to come and speak at the TEDx and put forward because we each needed to put forward this um, nomination. Uh, and he said, you. And I was, I was like, that's a bit random. And he said, oh, yeah, my dad saw some video of you on YouTube talking about stock market stuff. Um, and he said, you look like you were interesting and up to some interesting stuff. So I thought I'd just reach out to you. Uh, and, and his email came through from, you know, it was like a Gmail and it wasn't from official TEDx. And I was kind of like, this is some sort of phishing scam and I'm contacting the TEDx board and just making sure that it all kind of checked out. Um, but yeah, that, that was a bit of a fun ride. I kind of responded back, had a couple of chats and then went over and did that. And it was just right place at the right time. Like I was just launching all of my systems thinking stuff. And uh, I thought, oh, what a great way to culminate a lot of thinking and launch that business and um, it was a bit like that. There's a lot of work and very little immediate payoff for a TEDx talk. Like they pre screen you, you've got to um, work with them with the outline. I had to hop on Zoom and do practice runs and a bunch of stuff like that um, all the way through. And then they basically say, Oh, and by the way, you have to pay for your flights to get over here and you can't sell anything. There's no commercial intent in a TEDx. Um, but again, it was just one of those things where I thought, yeah, look, I'll just follow it and see it where it goes. I'm really glad I did it. Um, hard to quantify what the commercial benefit was other than the experience, but but I'm sure it's played a part. Yeah, totally. I mean, for brand, right, it's second to none. If you can say you got a TEDx, so it was what you've got like 60,000 views or something like that. It's like, that's a pretty yes. cool thing for your brand. And I mean, because you're known as the systems guy. And no offense, systems aren't generally known as the sexiest things. Like when you hey, see people selling on. stuff. I know, I'm sorry, I'm just being honest. But when you see people selling stuff, they're like marketing, sales, make more money, this. And you're like, systems. So how, how did you get to be the systems guy? Yeah, yeah. It's funny with this um, systems not being sexy. Way back when I used to be interested in sort of the stock market education space, that was like one of my things around the same time I was doing the um, MCG stuff. I was really interested in the stock market stuff. And I always found with the stock market stuff, everybody wanted to know what's the buy signal, what's the sell signal. And one of the most important components, which no one ever looked at, was the trading psychology. And the trading psychology always sort of triggered my interest. And now I feel like I'm almost, you know, Groundhog Day repeating that again. Like I'm interested in business and people want to know what's the latest marketing tactic and strategy. How do I sell more people and high ticket sales? And I'm kind of saying um, systems really feels like it's the building block of all great businesses. Um, and I feel like that's the sexy bit. And I feel like it is. I don't, so it's funny though, when I talk to someone who is a systems person, we get it. It's kind of like you're either a systems person or you're a not. And if you are, you kind of immediately click to the message. Um, and I realized out of all of my businesses, they all have had these undertones of systems and the way that I built it. And like my dad was a systems engineer. So that's, I have had some early programming that came from him and he used to create fun little systems to gamify life for my brother and I. Uh, and uh, I took that to the businesses that I ran all except I got to my last business, which was the one before I'm running right now, the digital agency. And I threw all of it out the door and I was kind of like, ah, oh, this business is different. This is a creative digital agency. And why would I put systems in place when Google's just going to update their algorithm? And, you know, half of my team were, you know, writing copy and thinking about YouTube thumbnails and making things pretty and building websites. And they're not going to want to, follow a system. 
and I, and I had the secret secret magic from the SEO. You know, I delved deep and figured out Google and all the rest of it. And I thought, oh, it couldn't be replicated. So I I ended up just uh, building this business around me and coming to the conclusion that it couldn't be systemized. Um, and that kind of held me in that business probably, I don't know, good 10 years too long until we found out we were pregnant. And then I thought, i got to figure out how to not be working a million hours a week. And I then looked back at my other businesses, looked at some other successful agencies, and I thought, this can be systemized. And I went on that journey. Uh, I, I pulled everything that I could from the previous businesses that I'd done, and we ended up getting a CEO, recruited her from internally, or promoted her rather. And then I took some time off while we had um, our, our two sons, and she ran the business. And then that, for me, was kind of like, a huge catalyst to kind of go, oh, this can be done. A lot of people struggle with this. I even knew systems were the way, yet I lost my way. Maybe I can figure out how to bottle this. Um, and again, just different things fall into place at different times. Um, I just finished systemizing Melbourne SEO and we took some time off for the kids. And then I get a random email out of the blue from uh, Mrs. Gerber, which is Michael Gerber's wife, um, who who wrote a you know the seminal book in the space, the E Myth. He's like considered the godfather of business systems, and his wife contacted me for a completely unrelated matter, and um, said, "Did I want to do some work with Michael Gerber?" And I was like, "Yeah, I followed that." And then I think that really kind of so sorry, she just the... randomly messaged you out of the blue. Yeah, how random is that? And I've there's probably three or four circumstances or memories like that in my life where I've had a random email or message come through that I've responded to that has set off a chain reaction, you know, whether it's responding to that Ted talk or responding to um, Luz Delia Gerber. She, she emailed me and actually, there you go. It was the same. It's the same reason. I didn't even think of that. It's the same reason that the TED person contact, TED talk person contacted me. She said, I saw some videos of you on YouTube and I saw what you were doing with um, one of your earlier book launches. I had two books. My first book was Authority Content. I loved what you did. And Michael is launching the last book in his E-Myth series called Beyond the E-Myth. Um, would you like to uh, launch his book? And I'm like, I don't really, I said, I don't do book launches. Like that's not my thing, but I'd love to do it. And she said, yeah, well, um, he's gone through Harper Collins for all of the previous books. This is the first book that he wants to self publish. And we got to find someone who can help launch it. And I saw what you did and looked on this YouTube video. And then she sent me an email, you know, they're in California in the States and she sent me an email to a random person on the other side of the world in Melbourne, Australia. And all, all the email said, it said, call me and then had her phone number. And then I. It sounds like a booty the... call, not a business opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, so like she's up at like 2 a.m., lonely. <laughs> That's right. Couldn't say no to the booty call. I, like it would have been a very long commute. Um, yeah. just don't I, I let just, your wife find out about that, though, right? Yeah. yeah. But, um, so I just, yeah, I responded and then followed that, and that um, opened up. Like I just followed that rabbit hole, and it was a, a wild journey of helping him launch his book and just seeing what he had built. Like the guy's a little over eighty now. And he he'd kind of built up a lot of cred at that point in time. And I just kind of got a peek into what it's like to have created that amount of goodwill and value and the relationships that he's built and how quickly I could knock on someone's door and say, oh, can you help with this? Or do you want to interview him for that? And people were falling over themselves to sort of join in the project. Um, and it was just an amazing experience to be able to work with him so closely and just get insight like he's a very creative person like that was probably the other big thing that i learned going through that process he is a a visionary creative and he's known as the systems guy but he doesn't really like systems like he's not he doesn't like creating them he's it's like he fell in love with what the systems can do not not the actual process and i found that was 
really good for me to to he, hear and see firsthand because I like I'm a visionary creative as well. Like I don't love writing systems and processes, um, but I'm a business owner and I know that all great businesses have systems at their core. And I know that it's the master skill. Like we're talking about if time is the most limited resource you've got and you can figure out a way to um, identify a task and make that repeatable and transferable and you get paid every time that task is repeated, that kind of made me realize how important it is. And it, it's about building the right team around you so that you can do your great work as the business owner um, without necessarily having to get caught up in the documentation. So while I am the systems guy, I, I'm a kind of smile when I hear that, like I get systems and I see in terms of systems and I systems think, but also it's not, the actual creating of the systems and that it's not something I really enjoy. Uh, does anybody enjoy the creation of systems? I mean, it's not the funnest thing. I, I think that's why it's very seldom talked about. That's why because yeah. sales is fun because you make money and marketing is fun because you get that instant dopamine hit. It's dopamine, 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 but there's no dopamine at all with systems. But it, you said it before. I don't think like no one's really like a, a systems guy at, at heart in terms of we don't just love building systems for the sake of it. But I think uh, when you run a business, you end up having to become a systems guy because yep. you're not a systems guy until you burn out or until you waste a shitload of money, like one of those two. Yep. And I've done both. And I was like, I, I wish that I, I wish that I had this. And I was like, this is your fault. I wish this was out like, there you go, I can put it on screen, like five years ago. Because I don't know if you know, man, but like I've burnt out a number, a number of times. My whole thing's my work ethic. Like that's how I got by. Yeah. I'm not smart. I'm not talented. I don't have any of that. I just work harder than everyone else, right? Just doing 100-hour weeks. And funnily enough, you burn out pretty quickly doing that. And yeah. so one thing we've had to do, and over the last, you know, really a year and a bit, our business is like going on what, like four times the size it was a year ago. Um, it's the biggest thing has been systems and automation mm. and implementing like steady flows, repeatable processes and whatnot, which has been an absolute game changer. And in this, like you, in the book, in Systemology, you discussed a couple of really, really key concepts around building out systems. So I guess if we've got mm. someone in here who's perhaps a small business owner who is, you know, maybe James Kent 2.0, working a whole heap, uh, burning out, stressed, anxious, all that sort of stuff, and wants to be able to have more freedom, maximize profits, minimize any, you know, uh, well, if you don't have systems, you lose money too. There's heaps mm. of cracks and gaps. Where would you recommend that they start? Mm. The key is most visionaries, business owners, so two or three things I want to touch on. One, you had mentioned who's the systems guy really, right? Um, and that comes from the mind of the business owner who creates. They're that visionary creative who might see a problem in the world. They create a business that helps to be the solution for that problem. They paint the picture in their head of what, their business is going to look like in the future. And that's kind of what they do. There are actually yins to your yang, which is there's uh, people who think in terms of systems, who like creating systems, who are, you know, managers, who cross T's, dot I's, finish things through to completion and finding, understanding what you are and then understanding what are the areas that you need to kind of, um, make you even stronger, like fill out those areas where you're weak. Because a lot of people, they'll say this idea of, hey, you need to focus on your strengths, which very much true, but that doesn't mean that you then ignore the weaknesses. That means you then find the other pieces or the other people that can then fill in where you're weak. And businesses, if you think about business as one big system uh, and the health of that system, like the outcome, the money, the whatever that system throws off depends on the health of the subsystems that sit underneath it. So if your business is one big system, then you underneath that there's marketing, sales, operations, finance, management. And these are like little subsystems. And it's like the health of those systems will determine the health of your overall business. And just because you might be a gun salesperson, and that's your strength. If you don't actually make the other areas strong, maybe the delivery of your product and service or 
the marketing or whatever, if it's not all strong, the whole system is not strong. So when I realized that and realized that these systems are all interconnected and poor performing areas actually drag down other parts of the business, that's when I started to realize, um, hang on, we need to identify what those key systems are that drive the result in each of those different departments. And, you know, we're not, uh, we're not McDonald's, we're not making a hamburger business and we haven't been doing this for 60 years. So we, we, we need to build the systems to suit the type of business that you're looking to build. Like I love hiring a players who are well-skilled, who come with a bunch of knowledge and they can fill in the gaps. I don't need to systemize every aspect of my business down to the point of, and at five o'clock we tie up the rubbish and then we throw it in the front bin. Like that, you might do that if you're running a hamburger business, but I don't need to do that in the type of business that I'm building. So then it started making me realize like applying the 80, 20, the aim of the game is how do you find the minimum number of systems that deliver the bulk of the result for the business and just go to work on those first. Now in the book, you know, a, 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 an easy exercise uh, that we start with is the critical client flow. And that has to do with identifying the linear journey that the client and the pros like the, the, the prospect and the client and the business goes through to deliver that product or service. That's a great starting point. But then beyond that, you then have to start to think about each of those departments. If you were to pick five or six systems in each department that would deliver the bulk of the result for that department, what are they? And then go to work on just those systems. So if you think about HR, it's recruitment, it's onboarding, it's managing. Okay, and there's maybe some handful of systems underneath that and maybe there are some performance management, but there's, there's a handful of HR systems that you just want to dial in really well. And then when it comes to marketing, well, what's marketing about? Marketing's about lead generation. Well, think about what are your top three lead generation methods and how can you turn it into a system so it's repeatable and can be done consistently without key person dependency? Because what most small business owners and small businesses suck at is repeatability. They're inconsistent. It's up and down. It depends on the person, depends on how they're feeling, depends if they're working or not working. Yet marketing is a function that needs to happen 24 7, 365. Oh, the, the standard days small business cycle is like you have your best ever. It's what, what's it? It's the, the, the best month fallacy or paradox, whatever yeah. you call it, where you go and have a record month and you have record profits. And then your next month is your worst straight after yes. that. Yeah. And it's, it's because, um, when you're in work mode, if it's just you or you've got a small team or the business is built around you, you're focusing on doing the work. Then the work comes to an end and you need to think about the next job. And we all know with marketing, it takes time to get people into your funnel, to warm them up, to be ready. So you actually want to be marketing all the time. So there's people already sitting in your funnel ready to go. And when you get that next work done, you've already started queuing up what your next job's going to look like. And the only real way to do it is through systems. And again, the more and more I look at business and why I get excited by systems and why I go, it is the thing is because it is the master skill. Like if, if we think about what a business owner needs to do, they need to, uh, and Dan Sullivan talks about this. We make it up, make it real, make it recur. Mm. And business owners are great at making stuff up and solving the problem and go, Oh, this is how we're going to do it. And, they can even sometimes move it to make it real because they're the first person to do it. Maybe they, whatever the task is in their business, they do it the first time that's making it real. The bit that you really want to master is the make it recur because the make it recur is where the money is. That is the asset that you once created, you do work once and then you continue to get paid for it. And it's, it's a com culmination of all of these little one percenters, these little systems that all contribute to a bigger win. And I mean, this idea of at what point do one percenters, like if one percenters don't, you know, have that much of a big impact in the moment. And when you zoom right down to it, at what point 
do the one percenters add up to them having significant impact? There's a there is a tipping point that happens and you start working on and you build these systems and it becomes part of your culture and you put a few more systems in and then you reach a critical mass. And at some point, I've seen it so many times now, the business will just take off like a rocket because you, you get, it's almost like reaching what we call minimum viable systems. You need to figure out what is the minimum number of systems that drive your business and focus doggedly on that because that's what a business owner should be doing. It's you're building a machine uh, and that can only be done with systems. And so if we go through, we're going through that, that standard small business cycle of yo-yoing up, down, up, down, but also the other one, this is what we hit. So we got to a stage where we got to a certain amount of size, which it was, it was a good size business, but we, it's just like we were capped and couldn't go on to the next stage. And it's like you sit at this plateau for how many months and then you work, 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 and then bang, all of a sudden it comes through. So what you're saying is that if you're at that plateau and you can't actually get forwards, it means that you may not have that critical mass of 1% as that critical mass of systems, which then allows you to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And the way that if you think about building, you know, we talked about the system and your business is one big system. Imagine that system working independently of you because what tends to happen is the business owner works inside the system and they start solving the same problem again and again and again. They have to tell staff, oh, keep doing that. And they have to remind people and they're constantly solving the same problem over and over and over and over. What what you want sounds to like do- like a small business ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you, this is part of the rite of passage. Like that, you have to go through that but you, you've got to be careful not to get stuck there. And most small business owners get stuck there. What you, what you need to do is solve it at a system level, solve it once and for all, because the best work that the business owner can do is solving problems, but not sa- solving the same problems over and over. The business owner does the best work when we're, they're separate from the machine. They can look back in on the machine. They can analyze it and go, that's the problem right there. Let's go to work on that piece of the machine and then step back out again. So sometimes, like you said, you grow and you grow and then you reach a plateau. If the machine can continue to operate when you hit that plateau and as a business owner, you're able to step out of the mix and then look back on the machine, it becomes much easier to solve the problem because every problem within business is actually a systems problem, or at least that's a, one of my core beliefs that, um, and with whether that's true or not, I don't know, but, but at least it makes it solvable for me. If I, if I say that every problem is a systems problem in business, well, now I can go to work on the system to solve that problem and then go, I don't have enough leads. Well, I must have, you know, some poor lead generation methods. Oh, I'm having trouble converting. Well, maybe my sales process needs work. Uh, I'm having trouble with cash flow. Well, maybe I have some cash flow systems I need to put in place. Every problem in business is a systems problem. And as you elevate and grow in business, the problems don't stop. It's just that the the quality of the problem gets better and better and better, like or bigger and bigger and bigger. You kind of get to work on more interesting problems. But this is the game that business owners sign up to. They are problem solvers. We just need to figure out how do we make your solutions recurrable and repeatable so that you don't keep on solving the same problem. That's why I call it the master skill that every business owner needs to learn because it's the way to extract the maximum value from your unique ability as a business owner, which is to solve problems. I think like, and you cover most of this in, in here in systemology. It's funny. I'm actually sending a copy over to our CEO over in New Zealand. Cause like, cause this is the nail in the head for a lot of our stuff. Where if someone's listening and they're like, fuck, that sounds like me. If they're in a small business, which is going up, down, up, down, hit, but hasn't hit that critical mass of systems yet. Where can they grab a copy of this or where can they learn more about you and what you do? Yeah, best just to head over to Amazon. Like if you're listening to this, you're an audio book person. So search Systemology. There's an audio, audio audible version of the book or you can get the physical book if, if you prefer. And then if you want to go a bit deeper, just systemology.com. We've got some different resources, videos and tools and things like that to kind of help keep 
this moving for you. The, the key, like if, if I look back on the purpose of this episode is really just to kind of relight that fire in you around systems. The person listening to this, if you had thought, hey, I've tried systems once before and it didn't work for me. I'm not really a systems guy or girl. Um, and you, you, for whatever reason, you've reached some of those conclusions. I want you to retest those assumptions. And I want you to look back at this because you can't build a great business without it that that works beyond you. There is no path around this. At some point, you're going to have to solve it. And if you keep on saying, yeah, I'll get to the systems later, I'll get to the systems later, it only gets... <laughs> harder and harder and harder because yeah, like you get more and more stuck in your ways your new team members that come on board don't have that systems thinking and that culture and that mindset so i just hope that you know whether it's getting the book or whatever it is that gets you going start to think in terms of systems if you're a business owner stick with it for at least 12 months, give it a solid, solid go for 12 months. And I guarantee you'll see enough results to go. We got to be doing this for the rest of our lives. Cause that's what business and that's what life is about. Totally. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. This is, this has been really fun. Yeah. 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 Appreciate it. Appreciate your time, man. Thank you.